Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Amy Rizzo. I'm the Marketing Manager for Keller & Holland. Today's webinar topic is acquiring and protecting your talent. And by that, we mean how to effectively use restrictive covenants and looking at the important role that they play in minimizing risk and protecting your business. Our speakers are well-versed in enforcement strategies and conflict resolution, so let's jump right in. First, I'm going to do a quick introduction to our firm. Kelleher & Holland is a full-service law firm with over 55 teammates with three Chicago locations, including an office in Naples, Florida. Our attorneys are licensed in multiple states throughout the country, which gives us a national presence, and our affiliation with Mackerel International Legal Network gives us a global presence as well. We provide 360 degrees of personal and business services, which means we are your one-stop shop and our legal for your legal solutions. Now I would like to introduce our presenters. First up, we have Andrew Bowling, who has an impressive award-winning career spanning over 35 years in the employment counseling and corporate compliance areas of the law. Andy counsels clients on all phases of the employment cycle from hiring to leave management, and he has handled large-scale reductions in force and high-profile employee separations. Also speaking today is Michael Lee, our resident FINRA Dispute Resolution Services Arbitrator. Mike handles complex commercial litigation, representing both institutions and individuals in a wide range of matters involving securities and commodities, labor disputes, and trade secrets. One last item before we get started. If you have a question at any time during the webinar, please type it in the Q&A question box in your Zoom control panel. We will address them at the end of the presentation, or if we run out of time, we'll follow up with you directly. Now, I will turn it over to Andy to begin our presentation. Thank you very much, Amy, and thank you all for attending our program this afternoon. I'd like to begin with some breaking news, and that is the FTC's proposed ban of non-compete agreements. This was actually first announced a few months ago, really in, in the first quarter of 2023 but it is a sweeping proposal that if implemented in its current form would preempt all state law to the contrary and effectively ban all employment related non-compete agreements. And in addition, they are taking aim at traditional non-solicitation and confidentiality agreements to the extent that such agreements stand as a proxy for a non-compete. And in this aspect, it appears they are taking aim at a concept called inevitable disclosure of trade secrets, which those of us who are familiar with Illinois law know is a long-standing concept of trade secret law, really since 1984 in the PepsiCo Richmond case. But if the confidentiality agreement is too broad, that could be a non-compete in itself. Now, will this happen? We don't, I personally think the FTC will announce its rule, but I also expect based on the vigorous preparals that industry-based groups, employer-based groups from the United States Chamber of Commerce on down, I think that there will be litigation filed against uh, the rule and the general consensus of attorneys on both sides, those who represent labor and employees and those like myself who more traditionally represent employers and industry is that the rule will be stayed pending uh, litigation. But it clearly shows the sentiment and philosophy of the current presidential administration and its key appointees in different areas. And also independent of, and, and by the way, I should add that the FTC extended its comment period to this rule two or three times. And I think the last window closed at the end of April. By roughly late March, there had been over 16,000 comments to the proposed rule. So the FTC has its hands full, hands full sifting through 
comments in opposition to the rule and also comments from labor unions. In fact, 18 state governments really through the, uh, their attorney generals, including the state of Illinois, filed a joint letter supporting the enactment of the rule. And labor unions in particular support the concept of the rule, but also uh, have focused on the FTC's proposal to uh, limit an employer's ability to recapture advanced training costs if, say, an hourly employee or any employee goes and works for a competitor and doesn't serve out or, you know, the, the term of employment that is associated with the employer's financial upfront commitment. In addition, the National Labor Relations Board has taken aim at the use of non-competes. There was an important decision by the board in the McLaren-McComb case earlier in 2023, which really invalidated core terms of severance agreements, employee release agreements, which employers have used for decades. And in that, in that decision, and also in a supplemental white paper memorandum from the general counsel of the National Labor Relations Board, they took the position that you know, restrictive covenants should not be tacked into severance agreements and also talked generally about how such provisions uh, restrict worker rights and also have uh, uh, a negative impact on uh, business competition. And of course, the FTC has used its position as uh, the agency responsible for allowing full and free competition to justify and validate its position on non-competes. And independent of its rule, they have taken action against several employers for using overly broad non-competes. And their enforcement rationale has largely tracked the positions in their rule. For example, Anchor Glass entered into a settlement where they essentially had to abandon their use of non-competes and give notice to all employees who had non-competes that they are no longer valid. Uh, the FTC initiated that action because they said there was a limited universe of competitors within the glass container uh, industry and that the use of non-competes effectively barred the emergence of startups and competition within that industry angle. And you know, as, as part of the FTC rule, there is no grandfathering. And so in, if enacted in its current form, the FTC rule would require all employers within 180 days of the rule going live to inform any employee under a non-compete that they are no longer bound by it. Uh, in addition, and this is surprising to some of us, there is a bipartisan bill that has been uh, uh, proposed in the Senate, including a co-sponsor, a Republican senator from Indiana, that would effectively ban non-competes. So there's a lot of activity on this front. Uh, many of you are familiar with efforts by individual states to limit non-competes. Uh, Illinois has passed legislation in the last year and just recently, the Minnesota legislature uh, passed a bill that we expect will be signed by the state's governor that would effectively in prohibit the use of non-competes on a going forward basis. There would be no retroactive application to existing non-competes. So not only is the federal uh, government worth watching, but all employers must continue to monitor state law developments. Uh, Amy, let's go to the next sl uh, slide if we can. And after that, I'm going to provide some general comments on my approach to drafting non-competes. And, and in our program, I'm going to take uh, more focus on drafting agreements and addressing key contractual issue. And Mike, who is litigates these things literally every day, it seems, 
is going to talk about enforcement and, and litigation strategic concerns when it comes time for my agreements to be enforced, hopefully in court and uh, not invalidated. When I'm talking with a client about drafting uh, non-competes, I recommend that they follow a pyramid model. And what do I mean by that? Well, you can see in the graphic on this slide, it is legal to have pretty robust confidentiality protections and assignment of IP creations for all classes of employees. And so I'm a big fan of having each employee recognize and confirm their obligation to protect confidential information, not use or misuse trade secrets, and to assign any work-related IP. Uh, none of the rules, none of the state laws I've talked about really impact the propriety of such clauses, although the FTC reserves the right to say that a particularly uh, harshly worded form of confidential information agreement could be invalidated as a de facto non-compete. As you move up the food chain or the hierarchy within the company, I think it's appropriate to have non-solicitation covenants. And uh, I think it's appropriate to have really all managers confirm that they won't be involved in trying to poach or interfere with employment relationships with key employees. Um, and generally, the different laws we've talked about will respect the integrity of no poaching agreements among employees, although uh, as a slight digression, the FTC has challenged broadly worded employee no poaching or non-solicitation provisions where within a particular industry, they are done in cooperation with fellow competitors in the same industry segment. And obviously, if you're drafting this agreement, don't compare notes with your buddy at a competitor because that can create even better, bigger headaches for your company. And then at the very top of the pyramid or the pyramidian, I think it's useful to have non-competes for your key employees. And this, I think, promotes enforceability by not having to defend the use of a non-compete for a low-paid, non-managerial worker and showing that the company has given some thought to uh, its use of non-competes and shows that they are really limited to key employees who, if they defect and go compete, could cause serious harm to the business. Let's go to the next slide if we can. It's important to consider state law variations because until the FTC succeeds in federalizing uh, non-compete law, enforcement of non-competes, the viability of IP assignments, confidential information protection is a function of state law. And in this aspect, there are great differences across the states of the United States. For example, many of you know that California has for the last 60 years or so prohibited non-competes as a matter of course in employment relationships. And there's a very limited uh, exception for uh, individuals who have a meaningful stake in a business sale. And by the way, the FTC will allow non-competes that are part of a business sale, provided that the seller has at least a 25% ownership interest in the selling entity, which is a pretty high bar to clear for, for many companies, private and certainly for public companies, it may be a non-starter. Want to talk about an alternative to a pure non-compete that you know, for some of my clients, for certain executives, we will take this belt and suspenders approach. And this is to include a notice period. What do I mean by this? You can have someone who is an employee at will, but require each party to provide, let's say, 30 days notice 
in advance of a termination. And there can be an exception by the employer if someone is fired for serious cause. What this does is it gives you in most states, and it's a problem in California, so that don't assume that the notice hack will work in every state, but it will in most states. If the notice period is modest enough, courts will generally require an employee to live by, say, a 30-day notice period, especially if they're getting their pay and benefits during that period. They may not like the non-compete, but that 30-day provision is often a enough time for many businesses to prevent that employee from getting a head start and more importantly for the business to build a replacement plan and have a succession strategy and deal with customers and maybe lock in key employees who might wanna follow this person to a competitor. Uh, and I, you can also generally require the employee who's on notice to be on garden leave, which means they get their full pay, they get their benefits, but they can be instructed, don't contact our customers, stay away from the office, stay in your garden and collect your pay during this garden leave period. Employers don't wanna to be too greedy. Many of my clients say, well, we'll just use a six month notice period or a three month notice period. And I get a little wary, say, you know, we can try it. Generally 30 days is going to stand up across most states. But if you go beyond it, it might work, but you're also at risk of losing both a non-compete and the notice period. Another factor that can improve your chances of enforcing your non-compete is to pay the employee uh, during the non-compete period. And you know, many people are familiar with, you know, in the financial services, certain trading companies, it is standard to pay employees their base salary during the duration of a non-compete period. And this is expensive because generally this is not waivable in most states. It's something you can look at and sometimes we can put those levers into an agreement, but assume you're gonna be stuck with this. But my defense of this position to a client is that if you're really concerned and we know the law is, is sketchy, I mean, it's not going in the right direction. Judges in this area don't like to enforce non-competes, but if you pay the employee their base salary, they're more likely to be enforced. And um, generally you don't need to include bonus compensation. If you have a highly paid, let's say, a, you know, a trader, for example, they may get a salary that is most people, the average person would think is reasonable, but it may only be 20% of their total compensation, which is backloaded into bonus and other incentive comp. My approach is to kind of look at the salaries for federal judges and state judges in the area. And if the employee is, is making at least as much as or more than the judge who's going to be looking at this issue, that judge is going to think it's a pretty fair deal for the employee. Now, sometimes it can be below, you don't have to double someone's existing pay, but that is an approach. If you've got someone who could really harm your company, if they jump ship, please consider payment. Let's go to the next slide. Now, a non-compete and a non-solicitation provision is only as good as the interest that it is designed to protect. You can't just use a non-compete to say, well, we don't want this person going to compete. That's it. You have to show a business reason that there are certain recognized protectable interests that must be protected and can only be protected through the use of an enforceable non-compete or non-solicitation provision. Sometimes customer relationships will be sufficient, particularly if the person has a customer facing role such as sales. Sometimes the goodwill and training and skill set of its employees will be sufficient. But generally, courts will look at this through the lens of is this non compete intended to protect the misuse and, and 
of confidential information and trade secrets. And you, you can recite, this is done to protect our trade secrets and confidential information, and you should recite that. But that's just paper compliance. If you're going to use non-competes and you want to give Mike a fighting chance to defend it in court or in arbitration, you've got to walk the walk. And what do I mean by that? You have to define your confidential information and trade secrets with some specificity and some particularity and not try to be too greedy. And that would be set forth in the agreement itself. But when I talk about walking the walk, it means in the day-to-day -day operations of your business, you need to be able to show that what we call a trade secret is treated as confidential. It is under strict paper or electronic security controls, firewalls. Access to this information is limited. Documents that are truly confidential are stamped as such and kept in our files. Uh, we have good security systems, both again, both physical and electronic. Let's go to the next slide, please. The other thing to give serious consideration to is this concept of blue penciling. And I know there are some, you know, we have some fellow lawyers who are listening today, and you may know what the concept of blue penciling is. But what is blue penciling? Actually, it's a definition that varies from state to state. For example, for those of us who are based in Illinois, if you hear the concept of a blue pencil, it is typically interpreted to mean a court enjoys the authority to reform or rewrite an agreement in its discretion. In other words, if you say this non-compete is going to last for three years and the court says that's too long, you have the court has the ability to reform that language if it wants to say one year. And it can also further refine the various you know, restrictions that are in an agreement. However, you've got some states, and North Carolina comes to mind because their Supreme Court a few years ago issued a very important decision in this aspect. And if you're a lawyer in North Carolina, the concept of blue penciling means not reformation, but we will simply strike out. We will take our blue pencil and remove an unenforceable clause, but we're not gonna rewrite that three-year term to a one-year term. And so what lawyers need to do if you're in a state or in a country such as Australia uh, uses kind of the, uh, that form of uh, blue penciling is to give the court some options. And this may mean if the entire United States is too broad of a geographic area for enforcement, it will be these nine states. And if those nine states are too broad, it will be, say, just the state of Illinois or just Cook County and DuPage. Uh, because, and, you know, there's, there can be a problem with that because courts, you know, logically might look to the lowest common denominator. Okay, what was the smallest default option you gave me? I'll enforce that. But if you don't provide the court with an appropriate waterfall or cascading downward set of options, it won't make it up for you. So look at the law that applies. And another thing that, you know, many companies make a mistake of doing is saying, no, we're gonna apply Illinois law, even if that person is in California or in Oklahoma, which has severe restrictions on the use of restrictive covenants. In my experience, and in many states as a matter of law, courts will disregard a choice of law that is different from the law where the employee sits and performs their work. And so, if you have somebody in a state with tough non-compete laws, don't assume that you can use Delaware law or Illinois law. In fact, the Delaware Court of Chancery was so sick and tired of getting bombarded with non-compete cases because many companies would say, well, we're organized under Delaware law. We'll have our agreements governed by Delaware law. They said, we are not going to apply our state's law. 
we are, as a matter of policy, going to look at the laws of the state where the employee works. And we will use that law to determine if a particular restraint is enforceable or not. And we'll look to see if that state has a strong public policy that favors the application of its law. So don't assume you can use one designated law for all 50 states of the United States. It just won't work. Next slide, please. Here's a few other little nuggets that I like to see include in an agreement. One is that the employee has an affirmative obligation to disclose their contractual undertakings to prospective employers. And they also agree to report on where they're going. In most states that enforce non-competes, this is legal, at least for the duration of the non-compete period. Uh, you want to have the employee agree to provide a written certification, sometimes an affidavit or declaration that upon request, they will swear under oath that they are not breaching the terms of their contractual obligations. Now, I love to put this in there, and more often than not, employers choose not to, because I think after 30 plus years of practice, I can count on my fingers the number of times an employee accepted the invitation in that agreement to disclose where they're going. And also, uh, I like to put in a clause that says, if you think our clause is overbroad and you can't get a job because of it, come and talk to us and we'll open a dialogue. We're not agreeing to modify it, but come talk to us. Our door is open. And I can count on one hand the number of time in employees have actually said, hey, I've got this non-compete and I have a job offer from company X, I wanna take it. And the failure to do that allows the litigators to show that you know, there was some cloak and dagger stuff going on here because they had an affirmative obligation just to be transparent and they didn't. And so this implies some nefarious intent on the part of the employee. Next slide, please. Uh, a few really quick things, narrow uh, in time and geographic scope is better than broad. Make sure that you do not overreach. Don't forego IP issues. Too many times I see confidentiality agreements and I see non-compete agreements, but I don't see a standard clause that says anything you create that relates to our business belongs to the business. And not doing that can create some big problems. Let's go to the next slide, Amy. Uh, next slide, we have anything on, on international issues. Um, I, I think that uh, I'll talk very briefly. Don't assume that US law applies if you have workers outside the United States, even more so than the state law issues I've talked about, a non-US court and government will apply its own laws. They're much different than in the US. Make sure you follow them. And now I'm going to let Mike Lee talk about enforcing these agreements. Mike? Thanks, Andy. So um, Andy is absolutely right on preparing these agreements. And you know the things to really think about, you know, everybody of course would like to, you know, uh, completely freeze out the former employee and have a 200 year, the entire Milky Way as the restrictive, uh, you know, the, the, the turf and, you know, that you can't do anything. But of course, we know that a court isn't going to enforce that. So, you know, we, we do like to look at the agreements. And, and what, I, what I do is I, if you will, I wear both hats. I help uh, you when you're on the hiring side bring employees into your firm and into your company, you know, and, and they may have a, a restrictive covenant agreement with, uh, with their current employer, and that's okay. We'll just find ways to address that. And if you will, I always say, hide them in the weeds to help, uh, you know, make it more difficult for that former employer or soon to be former employer uh, seek to enforce the agreement. Putting my head on the other way, uh, if, if one of our clients loses an employee, 
And, uh, you know, we, we pull out the agreement that Andy's written and we look for ways to enforce that agreement. So those are the kind of in broad strokes, the two topics that I'm going to talk about next. So first, let's talk about if you're looking to hire somebody from a uh, competitor. Um, generally, this is sales, right? You're, you have uh, somebody that you've targeted uh, at another company. He or she's doing a bang up job on sales in a particular industry. One that I'm very familiar with, as Amy mentioned, is financial services, right? And you know, you're looking to hire that uh, individual who has a sizable book of business, and you want to bring that individual along with you know, his or her clients to your new firm. And you realize, oh, he's got a non, you know, a, either non-compete or a non-solicitation or some form of both. Are, are you stopped there? Not necessarily. You know, there are ways to look to bring those individuals over the wall, uh, but there's going to be some tolerance, in particular uh, risk tolerance, as to you know how far you want to uh, go to get that person over. You know, that person may say, "Hey, I need all of my files. I need all of my information. I can't service my clients without uh, all of the information that's housed at at my current employer." You may say, hmm, okay, I'll take that risk and have them abscond with everything. Um, but you know that uh, more likely than not, that's going to trigger, as Andy indicated, that his or her agreement's going to have a confidentiality or trade secret, or we're going to have state and federal uh, trade secret issues that may really bollocks up the hire and put your new employee um, in the penalty box for, for quite some time. So then you say, well, Mike, then what do we do? You know, there, there are ways that we look at the agreement and see where your tolerances are, uh, how much information, if any, will the person take? How much uh, do you want to allow that person to take? And, you know, and say, hey, you know what, uh, employee, we'd like to, or soon to be employee, we'd like to invite you to our, our firm. However, you know, we're not going to tolerate uh, taking of mass information, but we can find other ways of, of finding that information. And, and one of those ways, of course, is public resources. You know, we can find information out on the internet. We can find information from uh, buying resources such as uh, lead lists, uh, internet services such as the white pages. There are plenty of resources available. So those are things that we can help you and we look at for purposes of helping you bring clients over the wall. You know, and of course, the, and as the business person, uh, and, and I believe most folks on this uh, seminar are, you know, the business folks, you, you, you do this every day. You make that business risk, you make that analysis, you know, how much risk am I willing to take in order to make this hire effective? And, and you know, we will give you the ideas, the parameters, give you some, you know, some different paths. And the question is how much risk are you willing to take, right? So of course, you know, the more risk you take, perhaps the higher the chance of bringing the entirety of the book of business over, but you know, it may be at a higher cost. You may take less risk, um, but of course, uh, as you know, less risk, the chances of bringing that book that you're looking for uh, to come over you know, that decreases. So, so those are some of the things that we would talk about and look at and discuss and see how we can help you bring your bring the new hire over with, with the information that he or she thinks is necessary in order to bring the business over. And that's, that's really the, the idea, the concept on the hiring side of a, of a non-compete uh, when, when you're looking at somebody with a non-compete or a non-solicited uh, um, covenant. Um, you know, if we can go to the next page, uh, Amy. Here we are. You know, the biggest thing is the information, right? And Andy touched upon this, right? You, you, you know that more likely than not, there's going to be the confidentiality provision contained in the agreement. As, as Andy indicated, at the lowest rung on his pyramid, confidential confidentiality of information is is paramount for every employee, and you want to make sure that that's protected when you are the uh, the current employer, right? And so that's that's going to be the question. We also, you know, many of us are aware of in, you know, the uh, various trade secret laws, both at the federal and at the state levels. You know, this is the super secret information. 
You know, we, we touch upon it every day. We hear about it in the news, right? Personal identifying information. That's stuff that you just generally want to stay away from, right? So the question is, how much information are you willing to take uh, to, to come over the wall? Um, in, again, in one particular industry, this doesn't necessarily apply to all, but in the financial services industry, there's something they, that's called the protocol for broker recruiting, where in the financial services world, back in the 90s, um, a couple of the firms, the larger broker dealers got together and said, you know what, we, we keep suing each other on these uh, restrictive covenant agreements as we take uh, brokers from each other. And, you know, it seems like the only ones who are making out like bandits are the lawyers. Right. So they, they came up with what they call the protocol for broker recruiting. And, and in that particular industry, uh, they decided that um, an individual can take, you know, sometimes what we call a Christmas card list. Right. The the basic information on customers, name, address, uh, email address, telephone number, and is able to put that in his or her back pocket and and can come over the wall uh, or walk safely on a, on a you know, on the yellow brick road to the new firm. Uh, that's specific for that industry. Maybe there, maybe that's available in under other industries. And that's what we look at and see if there's uh, a potential way of bringing that information over because you know that you want your clients or your, your new uh, hire to be able to contact those clients and have, a, have some sort of list or available resource to contact. So, so these are things that we look at uh, information, it's not necessarily forbidden, forbidden, but we do need to see what are ways that we can gather that information, bring it over safely so that your new hire can use that information uh, as, as, you know, to, to bring the business over uh, to the new firm. So, so there are ways that we do look at to try and, you know, <laughs> sorry, Andy, but, you know, kind of find those little pockets, the, the places to hide in the weeds from, uh, you know, from Andy's well-crafted agreement. You know, it, 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 for those that coach in sports, right, you always have to find the, the holes in the zone defense because there still are some out there, but the defenses are strong. Yeah. The, the last thing uh, with respect to uh, bringing, uh, bringing people over, right, we, uh, if you can turn to the next page, is, you know, the idea here, like I said, hide them in the weeds, make it look like they're grabbing smoke. That's the idea on the transition strategy of bringing somebody over that you can, and we can deal with uh, the restrictive covenant agreements, I guess, until such time as the FTC just wipes them all out under, under their new proposal. So, so that, that's, that's one side of the, of, the, of the aisle. The other side of the aisle would be, of course, you've lost somebody who's under a restrictive covenant agreement and what do you do? So if we could turn to the next slide, Amy, thank you. So here, you know, you, you, and this usually happens on a Friday afternoon, the employee walks in to the manager's office and says, you know, um, manager, it's been a great run. However, I've decided to take an offer with, with one of our competitors and drops a resignation letter on the desk and walks out the door. You know, of course, after the manager is hopping mad because it, you know, this person has just ruined uh, his or her weekend plans because it's Friday afternoon already, right? What do you do? And I think the first thing always is call your lawyer, right? Have the manager ready to call the lawyer uh, to figure out, hey, what, what's, what do we do next? And it's, it's the scramble. More often than not, if there's a restrictive covenant agreement, if people know about it, right? You call HR and you get a copy of the agreement to the lawyer, right? You, you need to have a checklist available for your management, for your HR. We'll help put that together, right? And you'll get a copy of that agreement and you start your investigation. You know, what has the person taken, if anything, right? Are files missing? Uh, who, well, how will you know? Uh, today's day and age, we do a lot of forensics, right? We look to see if there have been electronic files taken. Uh, in the good old days, and some of us may still have paper files. Um, quite frankly, open the file drawers, take a look. Are the file drawers full or are they empty? Well, you know what, Mike? We really didn't know what uh, was in his or her drawers. Well, perhaps somebody else did, right? Uh, staff people, right? You know that staff people are usually the ones on the ground who have 
the best knowledge of the individual, right? Have him or her look through the drawers. Um, well, you know, if they look full or, uh, you know what, there used to be a whole bunch of binders that the former employee used to keep and, and, and those were his or her, you know, we'll use the term Bible, right? And they seem to be missing. You know, we, we need to do those types of investigations. Um, just for fun, uh, I'd actually page through some of the files because uh, believe it or not, uh, there are some folks uh, who believe that they can leave files that look full. And then when you actually open them up, they're filled with white copy paper. We always learn things from uh, experiences. And, uh, you know, that individual thought he could be, um, in paraphrasing Yogi, smarter than the average bear uh, and, and tried to stuff the files with paper. Probably a really bad fact. It really was a bad fact when we were in court and, and we were able to show that to the judge. So these are the type of investigations that you need to do. Not only do you need to look to see if documents are missing, right? Because you know we have trade secrets, we have confidentiality, but then if I believe we can flip the page here, we need to find out the biggest, the biggest thing, right? Are is the individual soliciting clients? And that's going to be on the firm to parse out the client accounts. And uh, if you will have a script ready and have the other individuals start calling on the clients to find out, hey, um, we'll just use Andy as an example, right? You know, Andy has gone, uh, you know, uh, decided to take new employment and I've been assigned your file. You know, what can I do to, to help you out? But as part of that conversation, you know, by the way, have you heard from Andy? Oh, really? You know, uh, when did you hear from him? Did you receive an email. We need your person to start making an investigation for purposes of the litigation, right? Because all this information is going to be folded into affidavits as we are on the race to try and get into the courthouse to try and enforce that non-solicit or non-compete agreement. Um, other thoughts, you know, well, what if we just tell the other side, Mike, that uh, we're going to, you know, we're going to enforce this agreement. Maybe you send a demand letter. Um, Demand letters, sometimes they work. They put the other side on notice. You may have an employer on the other side saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You, you never told us, Andy, that you had a restrictive covenant agreement with, with your prior firm. Uh, you know, what, what are we going to do with this? Maybe, maybe that will help stifle the process, or it may not. You know, these are all the various different paths that we would explore as we're going after the individual. Um, one of my favorite ways of trying to explain, let's just go back to soliciting clients. Uh, for those of us that remember the movie Jerry Maguire, uh, if you remember when Tom Cruise uh, leaves the uh, sports agency and then they have the split screen up on the, on, on the video, on the screen, and you have Jay Moore on one side and you have Tom Cruise on the other side. And if you're, and hopefully I'm not spoiling a, a 1990s movie, but you've got Tom Cruise stuck in a telephone conversation with Cuba Gooden Jr. as he's trying to solicit him. And Jay Moore is calling on all of the other clients saying, hey, stay with us, stay with us, stay with us. That's what's happening on that Friday and Saturday and Monday afternoon uh, as the calls are being, as the competition is going out there to try and retain the client accounts. And, and that's, that's the way I always think about it. And that's the urgency or non-urgency, depending on how you want to do it, of, of getting information for purposes of getting the information to me as your attorney uh, looking to enforce your agreement. All right, maybe we can flip to the next screen, Amy. All right. You know, so you gather all that information. Um, and then again, the conversation between the lawyer and the business person. You want to, you have to make a decision. Has this person, the evidence seemed to indicate that this person is going to do harm to your company? or not harm to your company with respect to soliciting and taking of clients. You know, you have to make that decision whether we want to file the case, whether you want to seek injunctive relief. Um, oftentimes, I'm, I'm confident that Andy always does, right? It puts in a, a provision in the contract that if you violate the agreement, judge, you have the ability to enter what's called a temporary restraining order or some sort of injunctive order that will, um, as we say, put the individual on the beach, on the bench, right? Restrain them from further violating the agreement by using the stolen information and, and soliciting clients in violation of the agreement. Um, 
I'd like to say I'm a, I, I bat a thousand, but of course, any lawyer tells you he does is, is a liar. But, you know, oftentimes if you can show the judge that such a, such a provision is included in the contract and that you show the evidence of what that person's been doing since he left on Friday afternoon and you're in front of the judge Monday or Tuesday afternoon, uh, judges oftentimes, uh, depending on the jurisdiction, of course, will enforce that and put that person on the, on the bench for a period of time. You know, these are all of the, you know, all of the, the pains that you'll go through in the cycle of, of enforcing these type of agreements, um, you know, when, when we get into litigation. So, um, you know, we've all heard of like the blue wall, right? Where there's a, there's a wall of silence. That's going to be one of the things that, uh, you know, these are some of the practical things that you may encounter. You disperse the accounts and you say, hey, please call on these accounts and find out what Andy's doing. Well, you, you might encounter a reluctance of, you know, they're now all Andy's former colleagues, but they're going to say, you know what, he's a really good guy. Or, you know what, uh, I, I, know what the, I know what the firm wants, but these are really Andy's clients and, and, and not ours. And, and, and they may have a reluctance to do that investigation for you. These are all the various things that we need to think about, we'll address, we'll, you know, you'll feel the pains, you'll feel the pleasures of uh, as, you, as you go through the investigation and preparing for litigation. So um, the, the, in a nutshell, that, that's what we see on, on both sides of the fence or of the aisle when you have uh, either you're trying to bring somebody over who has one of these restrictive covenant agreements, or you're going to go and try and enforce a restrictive covenant agreement against somebody else. So, um, you know, just some other, so just some other, you know, real quickly, uh, depending on where you're at, you know, the question will be whether you want to go to federal court or if you want to go to state court. Oftentimes, I'm not sure, Andy, how many times you write these into your agreements. Sometimes they're not, uh, whether you have an arbitration forum involved, right? Um, these are all the things that, uh, you know, you need to consider these are written into your agreements and then these are things to consider uh, as, as part of your enforcement mechanism. So Mike, I'll jump in just because sure. you raised a good point about arbitration and I'm going to put FINRA off to the side, but just let's say standard AAA employment arbitration. I don't mind that. And sometimes I will use that particularly if I'm in a state where the law is not good and maybe the courts just don't like to enforce restrictions. The beauty of arbitration is you may not get the emergency orders, but you can tie the employee up. And if you lose, there won't be a public record of this non-compete was unenforceable by Judge X. So arbitration provides some discretion. It's off the radar screen, but still allows you to make you know, the defecting employee and perhaps his new employer to support him spend money and not spend as much time with, you know, your customers. So I think there's a time and place for that. Right. Well, and then, I mean, I guess whether it be the litigation through the arbitration or litigation through court, um, it's by having the case penned, you know, in, in a forum, uh, you know, quite frankly, I think in, in my mind, I always think, um, well, they might not have gotten the injunctive order, but for every client that I knew firm take, well, I'm now just creating the damages case for the other side. So, so there is some value there as well of having the litigation penned in the forum, whether again, whether it be in the arbitration forum or if we're in court, uh, you know, those are going to be some of those strategies decisions, perhaps on, at the get-go, if you're on the hiring side. Um, if you're on the enforcement side, you know, the, the longer that the case pens, you know, yes, absolutely, there's a cost to litigation, but, you know, perhaps either the other side's going to say, we're not going to build their damages case. So then you have a kind of a backdoor TRO on that person because he or she's going to, you know, sweat out the period while, while we're in litigation, or they're going to say, you know what, we'll just write the check and they'll just, uh, you know, uh, continue to solicit and try and move business to the new firm. You know, I, I know we have a little bit of time left, Amy. I don't know if, if we've been able to field any, if we have any questions uh, from the audience, from the participants. We do have a couple of questions. Um, 
One that came in is, what can we do with the independent contractors? How do they factor into this conversation? Oh, that, that, that's a very timely question. There's, there's really, you know, I, I think two big issues I want to flag on independent contractors. First, let's go back to the FTC. The FTC's proposed rule applies not just to employees, but to contractors. So if the FTC has its way, basically all non-compete agreements with an individual will be unenforceable, essentially, maybe with very few exceptions. But another, I think, even more momentous change and a more immediate change for employers is the uh, current administration's proposal to completely change the standards for determining who is a, an employee and who is an independent contractor. And this is a little bit of a political ping pong. If Republicans are in the White House, we tend to see a more expansive uh, treatment of contractors, a general respect for those relationships. You know, generally, if there's a Democrat in the White House, they have more pro-worker people running the Department of Labor and other federal agencies. And we see an attempt to really constrict the use of contractor agreements. Well, the current administration has done just that. And they have issued proposed new standards that in effect will say, if the person that you are claiming as a contractor is adding value to your business, if they are in any way providing services that are relevant to what you sell to the core of your business, they're probably an employee and not a contractor. And so I think an even greater priority for employers today, frankly, is taking stock of where they have independent contractors and trying to get ahead of this announced rule and, and looking at what's our plan B? How are we going to take these people on board? Oftentimes, employers use contractors because in a particular state, maybe you have to have a legal entity in place to serve as the employer. And for tax reasons, you don't want to have an employee resident in that particular state. Well, you may have one, particularly since COVID, where you know during COVID, there was some laxity in the enforcement. People went to other states and maybe they became contractors instead of employees. Those days are the good old days. For, from an employer's perspective, it's changing. And unlike the legal challenges to non-competes, I think there will be legal challenges to the contractor issue, but I think they will not be on ice for as long as the non-competes. That is a change that is going to happen. It's just a matter of when, and it's time to start taking stock right now. Got time for one more question um, that's come in. How about involving my customers? If an employer doesn't want to really involve their customers, but they need to approach them to get some information, maybe Mike, you can take this one. Oh, the customer issue. That's that's. It's always a, an interesting topic, right? You know, how involved do you want to have third parties? Um, from my experience, I've often find what the former employer plaintiff side they don't want to get the, the clients involved, right? They don't want to get the reputation in town that, hey, we, you know, we have sour grapes because we lost this individual and we're going, you know, and, and start and, you know, pulling former, you know, soon to be former customers or those who actually do go over to the other side in as witnesses and subpoena them and take their depositions because um, reputationally, that, that would probably hurt more so than um, not doing so. And so that's oftentimes I find the employers are reluctant to get the customers involved. You know, on the other side, the individuals who have gone to the new firm, um, oftentimes I hear from them, Mike, call on Mr. Smith and Mr. Jones and Mr. White, because I have a great relationship with them and they will fully support me and they will provide you with the information that you can tell to the judge and you can tell to the other side, hey, 
we want to be with Andy. Andy's our person. Andy, Andy is our salesperson. You know, we want to be with them. And oftentimes when I'm on that side of the fence, you know, you can get a lot of help from the customers. And of course, then in those situations, it makes it difficult for when I'm representing the, the individual, the other side's attorney, whether how, how deeply, how aggressively he or she wants to attack those very customers. All right. Uh, unless there's anything else you'd like to add, gentlemen, we are just about running out of time or at the end of our hour. So thank you everybody for attending today. Feel free to contact either of our speakers if you have any more questions or if you would like a copy of our deck containing additional information. Have a great rest of your day.